The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We are here in Salem, New Hampshire, and we are going to talk about dominance and dog training today. I'm super excited about it. What are you doing? Oh, you're showing your dominance. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. Let me give it a squeak. Good job with the squeaking. Okay, so... I found Bam stairs yesterday when I was underneath the bed. And Tell if you can see is. on the bottom strip, it looks a little bit different than the top of the stairs. And uh, that was because we used under cabinet lighting. As you can see there, that's our kitchen and that's for our coffee maker for Bam stairs. And the little piece that I have right here is just um, a piece that turns it on and off. That's so a mo- I motion wanted detector. to show you guys. Yeah. So this is just to turn it on and off. It came off of Bam stairs, but I couldn't bear to take the lighting off. So I had to show you a picture. But Scott had this great idea. Bam is our terrier. She lived till she was 18 years old and she kind of had lost her sight and had limited mobility there towards the end. He had a great idea that to put the motion sensitive lights that go under your cabinet on the stairs. So if Bam needed to get off the bed in the middle of the night, she'd walk over, her lights would go on. It was like the Las Vegas strip and then she could walk right down or vice versa. If she wanted to come up at night, they would go on and when they felt their presence and she could go to up. To get her into the bedroom, I stood with two flags, <laughs> waving, No, she her would in, go anywhere, Scott was. But really, the under cabinet lighting is great for your older dogs, especially with vision issues. If you haven't checked it out, super cheap, and you can buy these on Amazon. So that's my quirky that's tip. A great for the day. tip. Thanks, honey. Love it. All right, dominance and dog training. How do you feel about it? Where do we stand on it? What's going on with it? Well, I'm not real familiar with it as a training technique. Yeah, that's that, not. That seems it's to be not a, our there's, go-to. There's that's, a whole world built around this dominance training yeah. as a method. Yeah, they use, and, and that's um, not something that I've. That, yeah, if you've uh, listened to us to. before, that's not really where we stand or our wheelhouse or anything else. So I would say that like Caesar Milan uses a lot of dominance kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Monks of New Skeet, would you put them in that? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have. I'm not familiar enough with them. They're they're more balanced trainers, but but they do like the alpha and omega kind of thing. Anybody I think. that's doing the alpha roll um, type, you know way to get control or let your dog know that you're the boss by alpha rolling the dog. That's pure dominance yeah. t- training. And, if- and it's, you know, it's dangerous in my opinion. Yes, That's yes. all. I mean, I had a client, and this is years ago in California, that had a, um, I think it was an Australian cattle dog, something like that. And it had some aggression issues, and we worked, the dog was doing great. We worked basic obedience. Everything was going well. And then she called me up, you know, like a, a month after we had been doing training and said, My dog bit me in the face. I had to go to the emergency room, and we got to get the dog back in for some classes. And I said, what the hell happened? How how did that happen? Well, the dog got reactive on leash, so I alpha rolled him in the... I saw it on Cesar Milan. I alpha rolled him in the lawn, and when I went to let him up, he jumped up and bit me in the face. So the act of alpha rolling is more than just physically putting your dog on the ground. There's more going on there than just the act of flipping your dog and, and putting him on the ground. And if you're going to do something like that when the dog's aroused, then there's a whole other emotional state well, going on. Well, you don't on. let him up <laughs> until he's unaroused, <laughs> yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. But that was something. I just don't like to have a lot of conflict with dogs when I'm working with them. I want to be able to teach them, and, and the last thing I need is more conflict. And I'm not saying that stuff doesn't work, but I think that there's... It depends on who you are as a person yeah. if you're able to implement it. Yeah. And I think that it doesn't transfer very well. Most people really running through don't want to be real dominant <laughs> with their dog. And, and most people are not even that assertive. Forget about dominant. They're not even assertive. Yeah. You know, just they don't getting have them enough to presence, maybe just, just, just raise your up. voice a little yeah. bit so your dog can hear you. They have a hard time with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So the dangerous thing, I, I mean, I don't know. A lot of what we see on TV and everything else makes good TV, right? Like there's these crazy scenes and these quick YouTube snippets and this huge turnaround in a dog and this is amazing it went from a to b and you know wow but it makes good tv we had a client one time i think it was um i don't know what kind of dog it was an american eskimo or something like that and the lady calls us and says i talked to my breeder and my breeder said that when the dog nips my uh little kid that my kid should put the puppy on its side and then bite the puppy's ear and we're like hearing this like 
no, like red flag, like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, so. I've seen that. I yeah, saw that. And, and that's, but the breeder was like instructing this parent to have her child do it to this puppy that was going to grow up to be a big dog. And I mean, that kind of stuff is just terrifying to us, you know, and it's still being suggested and uh, used out there and everything else. And if it's working for you or you've used a trainer that used dominant methods and it worked great for you, that's all fine and good. But if you're searching for training, that isn't necessarily what we would seek out, whether you're doing balance training or not. Like dominance training is not something, as Scott says, that necessarily easily transfers. Just because your trainer does it or a TV show superstar does it or something else doesn't mean that you can do it the same way. Or even worse, it might mean that the dog interprets it differently when you do it than the original person it learned from and there could be fallout or backlash or anything else. Yeah, I think most, it depends on the relationship you have with the dog. I mean, if you have a lot of presence and you're that type of person where you're able to actually just move dogs around with your physical presence without even touching them. I mean, there's not many people that can even do that kind of stuff. Yeah, and there's difference between, for me, presence and dominance. Like, just because you have a lot of presence as a person, I think of, like, when we had Noelle on the podcast about the daycare stuff, she talked about hiring employees that have presence, that can move, that can, you know, have commitment, they can run a room. That doesn't necessarily mean they're flipping everybody over and alpha rolling everyone. That has nothing to do with dominance, but they bring this kind of... um, this, this, a, le- a leadership Yes, they, presence. they, they hey, bring a I'm leadership in charge, presence. Back the fridge yes. up. And, and that doesn't have to be dominance. Well, that can just be leadership. But yeah, but if you can't even do that, forget about now going to yeah. the, you know, biting the ear of the dog or rolling them on their side and Scott's all that. Scott's been of walking. Stuff, what's, what's the guy's name? Beckman on YouTube. Is that his name? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he, he's kind of more into the dominancy stuff, I would say, in no, a certain way, he, shape, or form. He's balanced, but he does do yeah, a lot more off leash uh, trying to control the dog. Yeah. So. And, you know, talking about things at barriers and everything else. And some of these videos, if you watch videos and they work for you, that's great. Like, it's not, again, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you're searching for something new, it might not be the right way to go. The thing I'm thinking about with him is more like if you want the dog to back off of a doorway, he's big about put yourself there, project your voice, like well, body block, all these of, things. It's a lot of good stuff there too. I mean, I'm, not, not, I'm not throwing him under the bus. I'm yeah. just saying that if you're seeing these types of techniques used and you can implement them yourself, great. That works out. That's all fine and good. But if it's not transferring, it could be causing a little bit more fallout and it could be something where you do get yourself in a little bit of a hairy situation. We had a Rottweiler a few years back. He was a strong dog. And there are certain breeds that I would say like Belgian Malinois also that the more dominance you bring to something, the more you challenge everything else, things can escalate quickly. Unless you're very talented and very yeah. physically strong and everything <clears throat> else and you know exactly what you're doing, things can escalate quickly. And I was personally having trouble with this dog, with Scott. The dog, I guess, respected Scott, if you want to say or whatever, but challenged Scott less. So he goes, you know, why don't you work the dog? And, you know, he had me, he, the, he was stable in the center of the room and I was working the dog and asking him to sit and he was on a leash and he was just getting more and more and more ticked off at me. Like you could see it in his eyes. You know what I mean? It was just <laughs> escalating. And I'm thinking like, all right, like whatever. It turned out he was like one of the two dogs that only Scott handled over the last decade. And that's just how we dealt with it. But we got this genetic testing for a recent rescue that we got in. And I was thinking that just because you get a mutt doesn't mean that that mutt isn't necessarily like 60% Rottweiler. Like just because a dog shows up some way, you don't really know what its background is. So maybe one of these like random mutts from the South looks like, oh, it's stripey. It looks like a tiger, everything else. It may have one of these breeds in it and it may predominantly have one of these breeds in it that doesn't necessarily like to be challenged. So now, unless you really know what you're doing, you got yourself in kind of a tight spot in my opinion. Yeah, I mean... uh Again, I, I guess fortunately for me, or whatever the reason, my foundation in dog training was not with that methodology. Had I run into some guy that was like Caesar Milan, as an example, and I wanted to be a dog trainer, and I met Caesar and said, hey, could you teach me how to train dogs? Then that would have been my foundation, and I would have probably ascribed to a certain extent to that methodology. But my foundational dog training is in competitive obedience, and... um a lot of it is more, uh, as I have a friend of mine refer to it as more of a technician. Some dog trainers are more technicians. Um, and I, I would not say I lean more to the technician side of it. But when push comes to shove, what I do best is heal, sit down, come when called, go to like, and not personal with the dogs. I'm rewarding them. And something that can transfer to the the owners also. Like the less personal it is, the less it's just about Scott, the more that it can transfer to the owners. And I would say early on, 
Like with Loco and stuff, you did some more like dominance types of things, like trying to like oh, but control that wasn't, him. Uh, yeah, that was just. It made it worse. Though. It was me being frustrated with my dog. Is but what you were it was. told to do those types of things, right? Well, I was getting very poor advice that, you know, people saying, no, you just have to kick his ass. What does that mean? Well, he's, you know, why don't you do it? Give uh, Here, take my dog and show me what you're talking about. Well, and then they wouldn't take my dog because they were afraid of him, you know? And they'd say, you got to helicopter him, like just whip him over your head or some bullshit. And I didn't do that. But one time he launched a dog and I was so frustrated that I just grabbed him by the collar and just pinned his head on the ground. And this is 20 plus years ago or something. And because uh, I was all frustrated with the dog, you know? And then when I, and I didn't hold him down there until he decompressed. I just held him down and said, you know, enough. And then when I let him up, he just grabbed my wrist <laughs> real quick. He was like, fuck there, you. Yeah. And that dog specifically, like right some dogs wrist. themselves are more dominant, right? So this specific dog was a dog that was bred for protection sports and everything else. Really nice dog. But he was like lifting his leg at four months. Like he was a strong dog. And I remember one time petting this dog in our rental when we first got together. I'm outside. I'm sitting on the stairs. And I'm just petting him. He's like a stair above me. I didn't think anything of it. I'm just sitting on the stairs and I'm just petting him. Hey, how you doing, buddy? And then all of a sudden, like you can just kind of, he's like physically controlling me, right? Like I'm a stair below him and I'm just loving on him. And then he puts his paw on me and then this on me. And then I'm thinking to myself like, shit, like I, maybe I got to get out of this. Like all of a sudden, like the tide did turn. Like I was like loving him and I stood up slowly and everything was fine. But there are dogs that have more maybe presence themselves or more oh, dominant certain, traits yeah. or anything else. And these types of dogs, like if you say like, let's tango, they'll say, all right, let's go. And you need to be very experienced and know what you're doing. It is an old school. I think it is an old school uh, methodology. And, you know, a lot of police departments are instructing canine handlers to alpha roll, you know, a police dog. And they're getting bit Not too. being respectful of them. And then they miss you know, read what is respect, what is not. Is the dog really understanding? Do they not? But they're just, you know, trying to step up, you know, as a canine handler without a lot of background experience and having a hard time with dogs. And they even um, backed off on a lot of Malinois in police departments yeah, because cops are getting bit. Yeah. You know, there's a, they send a dog past three cops to get a bad guy, and the dog winds up biting a cop in the back of the leg before he gets there. You yeah, know? it was a little bit too much dog for a lot of the departments, so you'll see more Mal and Shepherd mixes or just Shepherds. All right, we're going to go to break, and then when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about dominance. Does your dog lack self-control? Are you looking for some answers? Would you like your dog to be calmer? Does your dog lack confidence? Canine Mind Shift. Enroll in a free course today. Simply go to caninemindshift.com. That's caninemindshift.com. Okay, here we are. So we did a quick checklist of what we wanted to go through when we were going to be discussing dominance, and Scott brought off brought out the, you know, doesn't transfer and can be dangerous within like the first couple minutes. But another thing that you had mentioned that really ties into the police stuff is that it may harm your relationship. So even if now let's say this, you know, canine officer, sometimes often what happens with these dogs is the canine officers aren't the ones that have trained the dogs. They just get the dogs trained. So there isn't really a relationship established. So let's say they were given the well, information. The, the school they go through with the dog is where they get the opportunity to establish but sometimes, the relationship. Yeah, but sometimes yeah. they'll just end up and then someone's handling the dog. Um, and oftentimes, like if someone was maybe instructed to, okay, you need to alpha roll this dog, 75, 80 pound dog, maybe the first time they're able to, in the moment, grab the dog, put the dog on the ground, everything else. Don't you think the next time they go to do that, that dog's going to be a little like weary about like, hey, I know what's coming. Like you're, you're, you're creating this adversarial this relationship. Yeah, yeah it, it, all of a sudden now, like the dog's like, oh no, you don't. And it's just increasing and escalating the situation a lot more than need be. And it's the same thing with our pet dogs. If you're going to sit there and be doing a lot of things where you're kind of instilling fear or you know, this control through dominance with the dogs, there may be some fallout and you may see the dogs a little more shut down or concerned about you. They may respond differently to, you know, you're more, um, you're the guy in the household with maybe a little bit more presence that's rah, 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 gruff than they do to the rest of the family because the relationship is different depending on how you handle the dog. So yeah. I thought fallout with the relationship was a good one. Yeah. And most dogs are not really that dominant to begin with. And there's really... Uh, Especially the, most pet dogs, yeah. Yeah, any even police dogs, you know, any working dogs are typically not, you know, they're more dominant than a pet dog. But I mean, as far as wanting to be dominant over a human, that's pretty unusual, you know. 
they may be dominant with other dogs and stuff like that. But the way I always handle all of these, my relationships with any dog is I want to establish some trust with yeah. the dog right away and, um, and just start, you know, working them loosely and then raising the criteria over the sessions I'm working with the dog. I've become more and more demanding of what I want the dog to do. Uh, but also that trust, trust is being built at the same time. So they're not fearful. They're not, you know, defensive. Yeah. They're just, oh, okay, well, I did the last thing you made me do. It wasn't any big deal. And then they're more likely to do the next thing I want them to do. And I'm not talking about, you know, just luring them with food left and right. I'm talking yeah. about, you know, actually making them work with and me. And like I think of, you know, okay, if they're going to be doing the bed exercise, maybe the first 15 minute stint that they're on the bed, maybe their third or fourth session in. After that, it's a big love fest. There's this big like relationship building. Not that you broke the relationship there, but if the dog's away from you laying on a bed for 15 minutes after that, it's like, all right, buddy, let's be pals, everything else. Then head into the next 15 minutes. If you're you're using yourself or your voice or your techniques or anything else to, you know, control the dog's behavior. The dog may trust you less. The dog may be more unsure. The dog may not know what's happening, especially if it's, you're new to using these techniques. A lot of these things we see on TV, we try to implement them and it doesn't work because you just don't have the same mechanics. You don't have the same experience. You don't have the same feel as maybe some of these professionals that are doing this and having more success. Yeah, in the pet dog world, I mean, if you're having a dog that's exhibiting you know, what you might describe as dominant behavior, meaning uh, he's up on the couch with you and then you want to get him off the couch, he's growling at you, things like that, then uh, you shouldn't have him up on the couch yeah. with you. You know, you're, you're setting yourself up for a problem because if you back off from a dog that's growling at you, you're making them stronger. Yeah. So quite often you have a dog that didn't start out being dominant, but you taught them how to be dominant and now they're running the whole house and it seems like a dominant dog when really it isn't. It's a dog that... Didn't have a lot of boundaries yeah, it's and structure. A, it's a normal dog that yeah. is all of a sudden thinks he's, you know, bigger than he is. You yeah, know? they get a little bit big Real for dominant their dogs are, I think, fairly far and few between. Yeah, but, and Scott's right. That's a really good point. You can easily build a dog up to make it look a lot stronger than it is. And the other thing I want to mention about all of this is a lot of this type of theory and these principles and everything else are derived from wolf packs, right? So you have the alpha wolf and the omega wolf and who, you know, protects all the other wolves and who brings home the food and who eats last and all this stuff. We're not dogs. Like, we're a different species. You know what I mean? So I understand that, like, within a species, how they can be forming, you know, dominant stuff out in the wild and these hierarchies and everything else. We are humans. Dogs are dogs. Like, that's different. We're not animals. So for us now to be trying to jump into that doesn't really necessarily make sense to me. Like, that's kind of where I'm like, huh, like... That seems a little bit crazy. We're taking a bit of a leap here to act like we're another dog or we, you know, we can use these same techniques and they'll make the same impact. Yeah, and the one thing about dog-dog dominance and whatnot is they are geniuses at reading body language. Yes. So they're getting the message when a dog is showing dominance towards them or they're showing dominance towards another dog and they're, they're not typically pushing past the point of where aggression starts. They're able to do stuff with their presence and their body language and their, you know, all these different things. And they're all reading each other uh, at a level that we are not capable, even great dog people that are great at reading body language uh, after a lot of experience and whatnot, are never going to be as good as how dogs read each other's body language instantaneously. And that's why a lot of that stuff works. But the human dog relationship is a different relationship completely, like you said, you know? Yeah. And it's one thing to, you know, have a little presence with your voice. Like Scott said, if the dog's on the other side of the room, you're going to talk with a little more gumption. Like, hey, buddy, come over here. You know, you want to get their attention, everything else. It's okay to have presence. And it's okay if dominance, again, is working for you and that's your way, that's fine. If you train with that and you have success with your clients with that, that's all fine and good. But if the method is not transferring, if you're putting yourself in a situation where you feel like, oh, my safety could be compromised if I'm not really quick to control this situation. I could get bit or my dog could turn and something could happen, muzzle punch me, something else. That could be cause for concern. And then if you're seeing fallout within your relationship, it's never good to see fallout in training in any way, shape or form. And I equate it all the time to if you walk up to the dog and the dog's on the bed and you just want to reward the dog, if the dog's like, oh shit, you know, my human's coming over, I must have done something wrong. Like there's not clarity there. That's
that's not good for your relationship. Like you need to repair something. This is not black and white to the dog anymore. The dog should be very clear that like I got off the bed. Maybe they come over. They're going to grab the leash and get me back on the bed versus they're going to walk up to me while I'm on the bed doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And they're going to give me a cookie. You want the dog to be very black and white with that and know what should be expected of them, especially after extensive training. Like once you get five to 10 sessions in of a certain behavior and you're kind of taking this out into the real world and something else, you want the dog to have a lot of clarity with what the rules are and what you expect from them and not just have this like alcohol parent syndrome. Like, oh my gosh, like they're coming. I'm not sure what's going to happen. It could go either way. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is if you've raised a dog from a puppy from eight weeks and you've established a certain type of relationship where you're in charge, you're a dog, I'm a human, it's going to be my way. That's the bottom line. That's going to go through their whole life. You're never going to get to a point where you're going to have all kinds of conflict. You've already established the relationship. You're fair. You care about each other. You want the best for your dog, and you want to go enjoy this animal. That's great. When you get a rescue, you don't know their past. And quite often I say, it doesn't matter what their past is. We need to move them forward and teach them stuff. At the same time, that's not you know necessarily the best dog to be getting dominant with. Yeah. They might have we bit the crap out of somebody yeah. in the past. You yeah. don't know that yet. And uh, you don't want to just be, you know, jumping on some well, even, three-year-old dog that you don't know that well. Even the puppy situation, that's a good point. So you get this puppy, you have all these intentions about what's going to happen. If now that first night the puppy cries and doesn't want to stay in the crate, okay, small win for the puppy. Then you go to take the puppy out for a walk. The puppy doesn't want to be on a leash, doesn't want to wear a collar. You're carrying the puppy everywhere. If you start now backing off on all of these things that you want the dog to do and the puppy says, no, it's going to be this way. And then six to eight months in, start to instill all this dominance theory. You may have some fallout because the dogs used to be in like, no buster. Like I call the shots here. Like when I don't want this, we don't do this rather than now you come down heavy on the dog. So be conscientious of things. Do your research. If you are going to work with a trainer that uses those methods, make sure that they have really nice reviews and a lot of experience and everything else because they can get a little bit hairy. Yeah. I mean, I think about Caesar and, and so a lot of the stuff he does on, on the TV shows with dogs that have food aggression and resource guarding. And he gets right in there. The dog's not on a leash and he's using his presence and dominance to back the dog up or get between the food or stick his, you know, poke the dog in the neck while the dog's growling at him. And he's done that stuff for years. He's confident in his ability. And quite often, it goes fairly well. Uh, but then, you know, the owner of the dog is like some 60, 70-year-old <laughs> woman that's like, okay, now, you know, good luck. I think everything's good here. There's no way that lady and is going to do that. And not only that, a viewer that's just sitting on their couch watching and they think, oh, I'm going to go do this. Like, you know, th there's a lot of experience there. There's a lot of feeling the moment there. There's a lot of reading the dog there that you may not have. So, And I would say this, to, not to cut you off, but... That dog doesn't know Caesar. So here's a stranger coming into your house. So right away, the dog's a little bit like, what the hell's going on? Who is this guy? Yeah, off and then game. that person comes in and, and is asserting themselves strongly. A, a normal, sane dog is going to back up. Like, yeah. what the hell's going on? But with their owner, they have a different relationship. They've pushed the owner around probably for weeks, if not years. So now for the owner to come in and do that stuff, the dog's going to be like, F you. Like, yeah. What do you think? You know, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. We don't play that game. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another reason why I think a lot of that works for him. Where he and uh, and at the same time he gets bit a lot, and that's the fun of watching the show. <laughs> I mean, I'm everyone. I'm just watching the show. Thinking, you know, I saw him corner a Chihuahua, this really aggressive Chihuahua. The thing's biting him. I'm like, what are you, a friggin' idiot? But it was it was fun to watch. You know, <laughs> it makes good TV. Yeah. So if you're looking for a method. I wouldn't recommend that you start with dominance. Um, if it's working for you already, live and let live. And uh, I'm glad to hear it. But from our experience, it isn't something that we like to get involved in. And it isn't as easy to transfer over to our clients. Yeah. I mean, and then I just think about, you know, the smallest of dog bites. I had a client just yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we talked about that. And yeah. that dog's still, little, he's still recovering. Little tiny nick in the guy's thumb. And he was in the hospital. He's the got whole arm neuropathy was swelled in up. the hand. Yeah, like a dog oh bite isn't God. a joke. You don't want to encourage that. It turned into a huge deal. I yeah. mean, they were worried about sepsis, sepsis, yeah, whatever you yeah, call there's it, a lot, crap. there's a lot going on. So, so you don't want to be getting, you don't want your dog putting their teeth into you. you yeah. Know? And you don't want to put them in a situation where they're able to, like, uh, you know, if we're going to be doing stuff with clients, like or you don't want to put them in a situation where they the feel the owners they, are safe. They feel they have no other choice but to bite you. Yeah, it's that's not necessary, to, not necessary to get a dog into that headspace where they feel they have no the option but flight. to bite yeah, you. Yeah. That's not fair. All right, guys, we will see you next week. Next week, we're going to have all the quirky tips updated. So when you click on the link, because they're a few months behind. And in the meantime, keep it quirky. <laughs>
The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.